Well, hello and welcome again to our journey into number theory. And we're going to be having a look in, we're going to start ch uh, chapter 5, and we're going to have a bit of an in-depth look at the famous Riemann zeta function. Now, if you've been looking through the earlier chapters, you will undoubtedly have seen that the Riemann zeta function has been floating in and out, doing all sorts of interesting things, and you probably quite rightly guess that the Riemann zeta function has very close connections with the other arithmetic functions. And I'm going to just have a little look at that firstly, because I want to try and convince you how central the Riemann zeta function is to analytic number theory, and indeed, in some sense, to all arithmetic. So we've previously seen um, the following, uh, that the Riemann zeta function, which is defined um, by this infinite sum, where we think of S as now being complex, and we're thinking of the real part of S bigger than 1 for convergence. And we know that with, under that condition, we can find an Euler product for this, which is given here, which we've used several times. And we also saw that if we turn the zeta function upside down and take its reciprocal, you can expand that out as a Dirichlet series where the function on the top is just mu of n. And in fact, that's one way, I think the right way of defining this function mu of n. So we've seen series like this, the so-called Dirichlet series, where we've got an arithmetic function on the top, n to the s on the bottom, and we take a sum. So... Um, and we're going to extend, as I mentioned, the function to the complex plane as long as the real part of S is bigger than 1. We write again once and for all S as sigma plus i t. You'd expect sigma plus i tor would be more logical, but for historical reasons people have always written sigma plus i t. And so the series above converges uniformly if sigma is bigger than 1 and defines an analytic function, which we've previously called the Riemann zeta function. We've already seen uh, int an interesting connection between the Riemann zeta function and the von Mangold function. That is, the Dirichlet series for the von Mangold function is just minus zeta dashed of s on zeta of s. Now, it turns out that the Riemann zeta function is intimately related to many of the other arithmetic functions we've, we've previously encountered, and some that we haven't encountered that's still connected to it. And so I'm just going to list three of these here. Uh, the first one is that if you take the sum of the absolute value of the Möbius function and you take that as your Dirichlet sum, then that can be written as zeta of s on zeta of 2s. Similarly, if we take tor of a, the squares and we take the Dirichlet sum of that arithmetic function, then that can be written as zeta cubed on zeta to the 2s. And the pattern continues, we get zeta to the 4th on zeta to the 2s. Well, this turns out to be just the, the Dirichlet series of tor of n all squared. Now, you'd be wondering, well, hang on, what happened to zeta squared on zeta of 2s? Well, I'll come to that one in a moment. Um, and there are other ones we'll look at as well. Now, the proofs, I'll do the proofs of just 1 and 2 here, just to give you a taste of how these work. Uh, and the, um, they rely on the general fact that if Fn is multiplicative, then we can expand this Dirichlet sum as a product over the primes of, the, of, this, of this infinite sum here. This simply follows from what we've been doing up till now, um, how we got these Euler products, and also the fact that uh, this Fn is multiplicative. So if you expand all these out, you get just precisely this sum. Corresponding to, sorry, Formula 3, and I leave you to do as a little exercise. You'll see how to do it once I've done a couple of examples. And... As I mentioned, what, had, what about zeta squared over zeta to the 2s? Well, that I leave as a tutorial problem as well, but I better tell you what the answer is. Um, it introduces this new function, little omega of n. Little omega of n is the number of distinct prime factors of n. Number of distinct prime factors. Uh, so, for example, omega of 12 is 2, because the only prime factors of 12 are 2 and 3. 
So it turns out that if you take the Dirichlet series of 2 to the little omega n, and beware there is a capital omega n as well, which is the number of prime factors counting multiplicity, but this one's the distinct prime factors, then it turns out that the if you, if you take this Dirichlet series, oops, then you can write it as, let me get rid of this, you can write it as uh, zeta squared of s on zeta to the 2s. It's not a sum, it's the um, it's just equal to that. So sorry, typo there. So they're, they're left as tutorial problems. So let me just go through and just give you the flavour of how these are not very hard to do, just to give you a flavour of how to do the first couple there. So for the first one, I'm going to start off with um, uh, start off with the uh, left hand side so I'm going to start off with zeta of s on zeta of 2s uh, so I just write out the, the, the Euler products for these so for zeta of s that's the Euler product and then 1 over this is that's the Euler product so I get 1 minus 1 and p to the 2s and of course I can um, take the these under the same um, product sign and these converge for s real part of s bigger than one so I can mu multiply them together and of course I can factor this by a difference of two squares and cancel and I just get the product of one plus one over p to the s and we've seen before that that's just equal to the sum of the absolute value of the Mobius function that the that's the Dirichlet sum absolute value mu of s on n to the s. So that one's pretty easy. For the second one, again we start off with the left hand side. I'm going to look at zeta cubed of s on zeta to the 2s. And again we just write down the Dirichlet, sorry, the Euler products of these. So we get this, and this is to the power minus 3 uh, times that. And once again, you can factor this difference of two squares, cancel a bit of this out. You get one plus one on p to the s left from this one. And then the other term cancels with a bit of that, and I get one minus um, one on p to the s squared. Now what I want to do is I want to expand out this denominator here as an infinite series. And so I just recall the series for the Taylor series uh, about 0 of 1 on 1 minus x squared, which is easy to, to derive. You get 1 plus 2x plus 3x squared plus and so on. And that converges for uh, absolute value of x less than 1. So I replace the x with um, 1 over p to the s uh, up here. And so I get the product 1 plus 1 over p to the s. And I can expand 1 over 1 minus p to the s all squared uh, using that series. And I get, just get that. And now you just take out the brackets, take a deep breath and expand. And get like terms together. And it's not hard to see, you end up with this sum here. So we get a product over the primes of 1 plus 3 on p to the s, 1 on 5, p to the s and so on. So we're getting the, the um, odd numbers on the top. Now, we now come to the other side of the identity, so working now from the right-hand side, and I'm going to look at uh, the Dirichlet sum of Tor of n squared. And again, you expand that out as your Euler product, and you can calculate these. Tor, p is a prime, so Tor of p squared is just uh, 3, it's 2 plus 1 is 3, and then 4 plus 1 is 5, and so on. And lo and behold, of course, that's exactly the sum we had above, which is this one. And we've just seen that that was the same as zeta cubed of s on z to the 2s. Well, I hope you see from those examples that we've just been doing that this Riemann zeta function is really intimately connected with these arithmetic functions. And there's more to come because I want you to realize that the zeta function is at the very heart of uh, analytic number theory and the arithmetic functions and in some sense at the very heart of arithmetic. 
The zeta function is also related to the arithmetic function sigma and phi in a slightly different way, but in a very lovely way, which connects sigma and phi together. So if we have a look at this uh, sum here, this is the, this is the part of the, um, the Euler product here. So 1 plus sigma p on p to the s and so on. Well, we can evaluate sigma of p. p is a prime, so the sum of the factors of that is just 1 plus p. The sum of the factors of p squared is just 1 plus p plus p squared and so on. And this, I can write the first term as um, p minus 1 on p minus 1. I can write 1 plus p, we're tempted to write as p squared minus 1 on p minus 1. And 1 plus p plus p squared, we write as p cube minus 1 on p minus 1, and so on. And that enables me to pull out a factor of um, p minus 1 out of that, which leaves me, and I can, which leaves me with, uh, in fact, I split this into two bits. So I get 1 on p minus 1 times this sum, plus 1 minus 1 on p minus 1 times this sum. So I've just pulled the, um, I've taken this out and split this up into two sums. We can do all this because these series converge um, uh, absolutely, and so there's no problem with rearranging the terms of the infinite sum. Now these are just geometric series, so I can sum each of these ones. So that's just summing a geometric couple of geometric series, and finally put them back over a common denominator, and we get this expression here. That means then that the Dirichlet series for sigma of n is just equal to the product over the primes of what we've just calculated with, because that's the Euler product. So that's the product over the primes of this one times the product over the primes of this one. And if you stare at it, you see, well, hang on, this is just zeta of s minus 1, and this one here is zeta of s. And so that gives me a lovely formula there that tells me that the Dirichlet series for sigma of n is just zeta of s minus 1 times zeta of s. So instead of getting quotients as we had before, we now get some products for the sigma. And I leave you to do a similar argument to show that the um, Dirichlet sum of phi of n just turns out to be uh, zeta of s minus 1 divided by zeta of s. And that in turn gives us beautiful relationship between the Dirichlet series for sigma of n and the Dirichlet series for phi of n. They're connected by a factor of zeta squared s. This is lovely, uh, lovely connections between the two. And I suspect, I would, well, certainly from my point of view, they're, they're unexpected when you first study these, these particular arithmetic functions. So another interesting result is this one, the logarithm of zeta, which is equal to s times the integral. We can write the log of zeta as an integral. And we get a lovely connection back with pi of x. Pi of x is the number of primes less or equal to x. Now this one is an, I leave as a tutorial exercise, but you might have to look it up in some books to get a little proof of this. It's not that difficult actually to prove. But it's a very, very interesting result and a very important one because it connects the zeta function again back with pi of x, the um, number of primes less or equal to x. And indeed, there are proofs of the prime number theorem which begin with this equation. And then the idea is to try and solve this equation here for pi of x using Mellon transforms. Uh, this was the approach taken by Grosswald in 1984, for example. Well, the next thing I want to do is I want to extend the domain of the um, zeta function. We've done a little bit like of this before in the previous chapter. I want to extend the domain uh, of the zeta function at least back to the origin. So at the moment, we're going to assume that sigma, that's the real part of S, is bigger than 1. And that means we can do whatever we like to the terms of the series without any problem because it converges 
um, uniformly for sigma bigger than 1. So, this is what we do. I start off with the zeta function, and I'm just going to write the terms out. And we just start to, to play with this, we just start to fiddle around a bit. In particular, we look at, interesting question, what happens if we're looking at the alternating series? So I'm going to change every second sign and turn this into an alternating series. Well then, of course, I have to add back in twice all of these terms with the even denominators. Now, this one here then is now my alternating series, which is just minus 1 to the n plus 1 on n to the s. So this is the Dirichlet series corresponding to this function. And if I pull out a 2 to the s out of each of the terms here, well, of course, I just get back to the zeta function again, which is rather cute. So this is 2 over 2 to the s back times the zeta function. So that means I then have, let me just write down what we've got, so that says the zeta function, zeta of s now is this alternating series, plus 2 to the 1 minus s times zeta of s, and I can collect like terms there and I get a, a new formula for zeta of s, which is 1 minus uh, 2 to the 1 minus s inverse, times this alternating series. Now, for the punchline, the, the, this series here happens to converge for the real part of s bigger than 0 as long as s is not 1 because at 1 this thing is going to, to uh, not exist. But this series here converges for the real part of s bigger than 0. So in other words, we can analytically continue zeta of s to a meromorphic function i.e. this defined by this formula now and it's got a singularity at s equals 1 because of this term here. This one is fine at s equals 1. This converges at least conditionally to give us um, log 2 but this one here will have a singularity. Now if it's got a singularity it'd be in interesting to know what the, what the, the residue is so we check to see if it's a simple pole. So I'm going to multiply this function, this new zeta function by s minus 1 in the hope that the limit exists. And if it does, then that gives me the residue and it tells me it's a simple pole. So I take a limit as s goes to 1, I multiply by s minus 1. And I can use L'Hopital now because this is 0 at s equals 1, this is 0 at s equals 1, this is just log 2 when s is 1. So I can take that out, there's the log 2, take a limit as s goes to 1, differentiate the top, differentiate the bottom, gives me this by L'Hopital's rule. And now I can happily put s as 1 in and we end up with uh, log 2 times 1 over log 2, so that's 1. So I've just used L'Hopital's rule. So that is really nice because that tells me my new definition of zeta. I have a new definition of the zeta function which is valid for the real part of s bigger than 0. And it's got a simple pole with residue 1 at s equals 1. And I think we saw something like that in an earlier chapter but written in a slightly different form. So this... Um, this gives us then yet another proof that s equals 1 is a simple pole with residue 1 and you might like to compare that with theorem 4.4 of the previous chapter. Now in order to uh, proceed further what we're aiming to do is to extend the zeta function in fact right back across the whole of the complex plane. That is, I want to find an analytic a way of analytically continuing the zeta function, not just back to real part of s bigger than zero, but in fact across the whole of the complex plane. And to do that, we're going to need to introduce and look at some of the properties of the famous gamma function. The gamma function, uh, as you'll see, as you probably know, is um, a, a way of... Um, dealing with n factorial, but to do it in terms of uh, an integral. Uh, so we'll see that in a moment. So to, to seek the, to 
we, we seek to extend this zeta function further to get an analytic continuation to the whole of the complex plane and we, we introduce this gamma function which is, is defined for the real part of s bigger than zero by gamma of s is this integral from naught to infinity x to the s minus 1 e to the minus x dx it's a very famous function in mathematics you will have seen it in uh, at, at least the real version in <coughs> earlier courses in calculus so the integration here is carried out along the positive real axis in the x plane. Now you need you can check that it, this this in, improper integral does in fact converge for real part of s bigger than zero. You can play around and check all those details. The notation capital gamma, that's a capital Greek gamma of course, goes back to Legendre. And a function has the following properties. Firstly, it has this lovely multiplicative property here that s times gamma of s gives you gamma of s plus 1, which gives us a recursive way of defining this or evaluating the gamma function, and gamma of 1 is equal to 1. If you whack 1 back into here, it's pretty easy to show you get 1. That's fairly trivial. Here's where we see it generalizes the factorial function because if n is a non-negative integer, then gamma of n plus 1 is just n factorial. And that follows by induction simply using this. So um, gamma of, say, 5 is equal to 4 factorial, 24. So the gamma function, if you will, interpolates the um, factorial function. Now, remember, gamma is defined for the real part of s bigger than 0, so gamma of a half must have a perfectly good value and surprisingly it turns out to be root pi. One is always surprised by these things that there's no, in the definition here, there's no trig functions, of course there's exponentials, uh, but suddenly pi magically appears. That's a lovely result here. Um, and in fact uh, this one here you can derive in fact from part d and i'll leave you to do that one this one is more difficult and again i'm going to leave this as a you can look it up in books it's a tutorial problem it's a standard result this one says if you multiply gamma of s times gamma of 1 minus s then you get pi over sine of pi s now this one is more difficult and it also, uh, it's a functional equation. And this one, part D, enables us to extend gamma analytically to a meromorphic function on the complex numbers with simple poles at each of the negative integers and zero. So gamma, the analytic extension of gamma um, has simple poles at 0, minus 1, minus 2, and so on. And you can calculate the residues. Again, this is all this is all left as an exercise. You can calculate the residues turn out to be just minus 1 to the n on n factorial. So just as a little example, we can calculate then, we can use d to get an analytic extension of gamma back to negative values. And so, for example, um, if we put s is 5 halves, into the expression here, then we can calculate a gamma of, say, minus 3 halves. So that is simply by part d. This is pi on sine of pi, 5 pi on 2. That's, of course, 1 times 1 over gamma of 5 halves. And then we can use parts a and c to simplify this expression because gamma of 5 halves is just gamma of 1 plus 3 halves. And you can then use the formula A to bump this down until you get gamma of a half, which is root pi. And the root pi you get in the denominator here cancels with the pi to give you a root pi on the top. So you can evaluate these things. You might like to play around with calculating uh, various values of gamma using these four properties. We'll have a look at some further properties of gamma in the next section.